So it's a big hello to Dave and Di Taunton. Hi guys, how are you? Very good, Hi, yourself? Fine. Very well, thank you. Now it's been a while since we chatted. We actually talked to you guys uh, back probably ooh, three and a half. Late weeks. 2015? You've got a better memory than me. So four and a half. Yeah, it was late 2015, yeah. Late 2015. So at that point when we spoke to you, you guys were, um, were making plans to head away uh, on your yes. big experience of traveling. Um, basically yes. uh, telling the kids that you were abandoning them and away you were going. So you're what, basically you've, you've spent most of the last, well, four and a half years traveling, a bit of time back in Australia. Yes. We were catching up with you. So let's go back to that beginning. What was it that prompted you guys to decide to, to do this? I mean, it's a big move at the end of the day to basically chuck everything into storage, say hooray to the kids and hit the road. What was your, what was your catalyst? Well, basically, I was, Adine's a little bit older than me and she was approaching 60 and I was coming up 55 and my work offered me another five-year contract. And we discussed it because I've already had this passion to just try and travel over land as far as we can go, right, without flying. And so we sat down and we discussed it and we thought, well, how much money do you need in life? Like, health is a big issue. And we were both really fit and we were both, you know, raring to go. And I said, this could be our one opportunity to just go away for five years, you know, just travel, just take our time, see the entire world and we actually started thinking well could we uh, circumnavigate the world without flying you know mm -hmm. um, so things like that started to creep in and once the seed is planted it grows and grows and grows so the issue was finance um, so we looked at um, well how much money did we have and then for probably about the 12 months before uh, before my contract at, um, and finished where I worked we just saved we just saved our money, saved everything up, and um, then basically we were living off our superannuation for the period without going silly, and you know we made sure we did everything as cheap as we possibly could, and um, it all just kind of fell into place, you know that we could do this, and it's really interesting because we travelled for just nearly two years in Asia, and we found that we were living cheaper in Asia for two years than we were in our normal life in Australia. So our money was going quite a long way. It did change though once we hit Europe. <laughs> and we, <laughs> a little bit tougher there. Um, and in the end, that's one thing that was weighing us down was the cost of Europe. Um, certainly probably made it a little bit shorter what we could afford to travel. Yeah, uh, and required us to come back for a little while. It's um, interesting. Yeah. So, so basically, that's it. We just decided before we got too old, let's do the tough travelling now. And yeah. so we set off at age fifty-five and had a great three, four years. It's interesting what you say there in terms of budgeting. You know, Asia is so cheap, and and people have this perception of travel being expensive. But did you guys find in Asia you could pretty much just live off your superannuation? You weren't having to eat into any other funds. Uh, we were basically, yeah, we were actually, what we allocated for the fortnight, we had money left over. Right. So, so we were, we were, we weren't, I think we budgeted about 130 Australian dollars a day, right, for Asia, and we weren't spending that much. Bearing in mind, we weren't staying at five-star resorts and things like that. We, mm -hmm. you know, uh, we, we tried to find, um, the cheaper alternatives and we also traveled um by bus a lot and um train which is very cheap in asia mm. so so we did those type of things so one thing that fascinates me with you guys is this, is this overland travel now you don't have a fear of flying you've both traveled a lot in the past in your younger yep. days and flown a lot what was yep. your reason behind doing that well i guess a lot of times we found that you just fly over really interesting places and flight now has become so cheap and so easy that people just do it like they do catching a bus down the road, I suppose. But when you do go by ferry, when you do go by train, when you do go by bus, by tuk-tuk sometimes, you know, it's more of an adventure. It's more interesting and you get to see more of the real life, if you know what I mean. Like if you're just flying from one tourist spot to the next, you miss so much in between. 
and we found some of our best adventures were, um, you know, what we found on the on the road, on the in the trains, on the buses, getting from one place to the next, and that was the highlight of the trip. I think the fact that we did it at times really difficult. We were often the only uh, Westerners on the bus or the only Westerners here and there, and we really enjoyed that. We, yeah. Well, that's the authentic experience. Yeah, a challenge. Yep. Well, tell, adventure. Us, tell us a bit about your um, your travels then, because I think most people's first thoughts are, so how do you get from Australia up to, say, I don't know, China or wherever, uh, overland? How did you actually make it? Well, we, um, we did lash out living Australia. We did spend big, and um, we got on a cruise ship that went from Sydney to Bali. Okay. Uh, it was a a five-star cruise ship, and we just thought this is our special present to each other. Um, and, um, and we and we did lash out on a nice ship. It was the um, Azamara Quest, and the um, and that got us to Bali. And then basically from Bali, it was a bus to the to the ferry terminal at the top of Bali, and then we caught a, a ferry over to Java, and then we went by train from Java to Jakarta, and then it was ferries all the way from Jakarta through to Singapore. And then once we got to Singapore, it was fairly easy from there because the trains and buses. Um, and I particularly like train travel. I, I really, there's something about train travel I just adore, just sitting back and, um, you know, we caught the train from Johor just outside of Singapore in Malaysia all the way to Penang. And then we caught the ferries all the way from Penang right around to to Krabby, was it? Somewhere yeah, around there? Krabby. And then, you know, like just... Island hopped. Island hopped all the way. We stopped at about four or five different Thai islands and Malaysian islands. And and it's all geared. It's all there. You just yeah. you just got to get on it and do it, you know? Um, but it, it takes planning, and this is where my wife comes in. She's very good at researching. Um, I get the ideas and then she fills in the details um, and you know when, once we got to Thailand then it was trains all the way through um, at Cambodia, Vietnam and, and then sometimes trying to organise visas gets a bit tricky you know because you, you don't know when you're going to arrive somewhere and you've got to make sure like places like Vietnam you've got to have your visa before you arrive and then China is always an interesting attempt at getting visas when you're not in your own country but you just got to use the internet and learn these things. Um, getting from China to Japan was interesting because we had to catch a ferry um, and it was an overnight ferry. So we were on this overnight ferry and it was a massive ferry, but there was like 20 people on it. <laughs> and we, we were completely at a loss how it makes money. And you know. So we caught the ferry over to Japan. And then the ferry to Korea. And, you know, it just fell in a place. And one of it, we had a list of things that we really wanted to do before we left. And one for me was the uh, Beijing to Moscow uh, Transmongolian uh, mm -hmm. train trip. You know, so we headed towards that. That's how eventually we left, um, we left um, Asia. Um, Asia for Europe. But... Getting there, you know, we caught the train from Shanghai to Tibet. Now, that's a train trip. It takes two days and it was absolutely magnificent. But just, you know, you've got a bit of an idea about how these things are going to work. So, yes, and, and we didn't head straight up the coast, sorry, straight to Europe. We did a big, massive loop around and ended up going to Tibet and Kathmandu and India and Myanmar and then back around and then over to the Philippines. And it, it, like it wasn't a direct route, but we ended up making our way eventually to Moscow. How did, so, you, uh, how did you find the standard of the, um, the ferries and stuff? Because I guess a lot of people got visions of, you know, a little guy in a rowboat getting you from A to B. But they sometimes we forget there's a big population in Asia and there's ferry boats and, and transport running all over the place. Was most of it of a decent standard? Um, most of them were. Um, it, it's funny, the one we caught from Jakarta to Singapore, um, we're, we like to travel first class if we can. You know, if, if it's available and 
So we got into first class and we were the only Westerners on the ship. So the captain took great delight in inviting us everywhere and he he went overboard. He, 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 and he, I think we met a group of uh, Malaysian ladies who were all went to school together and they all took to us. You know, it was like everyone was surprisingly nice to us. Um, some of the ferries, the ones from... Bali to Java. Uh, I think one sank the week before we <laughs> went. <laughs> um, so that was in the back of our mind. Um, it, it was actually funny because they said the only two people missing were the captain and the first mate. And we thought, oh, they drowned. And they said, oh, no, they're hiding. Because <laughs> <laughs> apparently it was a car ferry and they left the back part down yeah. and they took off and it sank. So that was interesting because we went the next week and, 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 and we just made sure it came up before we took off. But on the whole, they were they yeah. absolutely fine. Yeah. We had, we had no problems. Yeah. Um, uh, Diane gets seasick. Um, and I will tell them, she got very seasick one time. It was a very rough ferry that we went on and we were the last ferry that was allowed out. And we hit really bad weather. And well, I think 90% of people got sick on board. That's so I really think that the standards, perhaps, if it was in Australia, that ferry would never have been allowed to leave. But they cancelled them just after we left. So, so that was interesting. And we also went to an island in Malaysia where the weather changed really nasty and we couldn't get back. Um, so we were stuck on this island for like five days. Um, Malaysia sent the Navy to rescue everybody on the island, but they forgot about our little beach resort. So, so we saw, we were told to be on the beach waiting for this ferry tour, this uh, naval boat to arrive. And the, there was about 30, 40 people waiting. And um, we saw the Navy boat go past and then... And then two hours later, we saw it go past again, and they said, oh, they forgot to pick us up. So, so they saved the other people around at the capital, so then they put us in a little ferry and they took us around to the, um, to the capital and they said, hopefully the Navy will come back. And then they said, look, the seas have died a little bit. We're going to risk you in a ferry. And um, Diane's all prepared to be sick and everything. And I had all these bags and... Yes. To go no, no, but we went, <laughs> and then the two, um, the two Malaysian girls next to me, they got sick. So I'm looking after these two Malaysian girls being sick as we went across. And Diane's going, I can't look, I can't look. <laughs> but we made it back all right. It's um, it's those things that sometimes don't go to plan that are your best travel memories, though, aren't they? So you know, best, you don't, the best. You, you don't mind it after the event when you can look back at it. Di, how does it yeah. feel um, being the organizer for Dave's big vision? Does he sometimes paint a picture that's a bit hard to follow through on, or do you find you can? Uh, you know, not really. He actually listens to me when I say, "Okay, this is a practical." Or, um, yeah, we we bounce it around. We haven't. Um, no, it's been quite smooth actually in that regard because I'll say, okay, if we can't do it this way, we have to look at another way of getting somewhere. Like we were, we had issues with getting from one end of Myanmar to the other and because we planned to go through Thailand, Myanmar into India, but there were major issues with the, um, visa. With the visa at that time. You had to enter and exit at the same. So it was like, Okay, David, we can't do it. We kept waiting and waiting and waiting for the change in the visa. Ultimately, we had to go all the way around through uh, Kathmandu into India. And then the visa situation changed, changed. and we came through Myanmar from the north. But yeah. it was like, yeah, no, it, it, work, it worked out okay. He listens to me. <laughs> so I don't have much I'm usually... <laughs> you're a rear re man, David. You're a rear re man. <laughs> No, but um, I have certain boxes that I, the need to be ticked where accommodation is concerned, especially in Asia, it has to have a pool. I cannot stand the humidity and there isn't some relief other than air conditioning. So I do all the tick the boxes on the accommodation. And you're, um, if I remember from last time when we spoke, you're quite a spreadsheet lover, aren't you? You lay everything out in <laughs> columns and rows and, you know. Spreadsheet you need queen. 
yeah, 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 that's funny. Not a bad yeah. way to go. I, I remember getting a lot out of you from that last interview about the need to be properly organised with these things. So. Oh, okay, yeah. It, it, oh, it drives you nuts sometimes with me being too far organised. You know, like sometimes it needs to be a little bit of spontane spontaneity, but I... <laughs> Yeah. Hang on, hang on. It's another week away. We've, we've, can we book this accommodation a week away? No, just wait until we. So I tend to be a much too. more. When we first yeah. had the road, we were so organised and we were planning so far in advance. And once you actually get out there, you find you don't have to be yeah. organised as you think. And I remember guys when we used to do the interviews a while ago and talking to guys going, Oh, yeah, I'm just weighing up next week whether I'll go to Latvia or Portugal. And it's like, really? You're leaving it that late? But once <laughs> you get out there and you realise that... Exactly. You, yeah, you exactly. Do it a lot more easily. I don't know if I could quite do that with plane travel. You Generally, you pay a premium for leaving it that late. Yeah. The accommodation now, yeah. these days, it's, it's easy. Actually, that kind of leads me on to the next thing I was going to ask you guys, because you've travelled a lot in your younger days. You're, you're quite experienced uh, travellers. And I know you spent a lot of time away with the kids back in, you know, 2007, 2008. What, what differences have you noticed traveling now versus back then in terms of um, the ease of doing it, the the, um, the resources that are now available to you? What, what's some of the biggest differences you've seen? Uh, basically, this is our lifesaver, the yeah. phone. We can organize everything on this. Yeah. We just we just do everything. Um, um, very, and, and the more we use it, the better we get. And And I think one of the big things is Blogs, right? This one we've written a blog, and and for us it's a more a keepsake. It's more a diary, but a lot of people now they write blogs, and it helps us so much to do things. You know what I mean? Like we follow dozens of people online, and they're always coming up with ideas and information that we can use that, that benefits us. So. Yeah, that wasn't around back in. But that wasn't around, yeah. you know, 10, 15 years ago, where yeah. it is now. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah. it's all there. You yeah. just got to, especially on Facebook, you can follow 20, 30 decent people and, and they'll tell you how to do things, you know. Um, and plus, some of the things we were following, we ended up meeting the people. Yeah. You yeah. Know? We, we actually bumped, you know, they were in the next country, so we just zipped over to see them, you know. Or I think uh, Joe Rob, we we travelled halfway across the country just to see her and have dinner and then come back, you know. So yeah, you get to know these people, you know. And and I wouldn't call, I mean, they're friends really. You don't know them, you never met them. So it's always nice to bump into them, you know. Yeah. And we've done that with a couple, haven't we? Yeah. yeah. Well, when you get out there, you realise there's quite a community of people that are doing this. You know, you you yes. kind of. Before you start doing it, you don't really hear about it a lot. And then once you start, you realise that, oh, hold on a minute, you're opening a Pandora's box. And we're like you, we've, we've made friends now from travel. We've made, made friends just from interviews that we've done. And then we've gone on and met the people. And uh, it, it is really a wonderful way to travel and a great way to share experiences with others. And, and the great yeah. thing is others have been there before you. As you say, there's blogs out there, there's information out there, there's so much online. Um, that really nobody is going anywhere new these days that somebody hasn't already been there first and, and count their experiences, can exactly. they? Difference. Yeah. And what was also pleasing, that people started following us and started asking us questions and then they were, we really want to do what you're doing. Yeah. You know, give us information. And, and then to hear that they are now travelling, um, one from Canada is going to visit us soon. She's been travelling 18 months. But she followed us for like two years before she made the move. You know what I mean? But we also met them in England. Oh, we met them in England as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. When they first started. Yeah. So it's good that people then started asking us, and we thought, oh, we're important. <laughs> That's right. You've come to very quickly. So yeah. what's been uh, what's been your favourite destination travelling, and why? Iceland. Yeah, I think we'll both say Iceland. Iceland for number one. But I also, we walked the Camino. Have you heard of the Camino? Yes. The Camino yes. Santiago? We've actually, we walked uh, it. We've got a magazine issue coming out very shortly. In fact, it might even come out before this interview gets released. And uh, the, the main interviewer on that is a, is a lady who's walked the Camino. So it's one of those things. I remember we first heard of the Camino about three or four, or maybe five years ago now. Never heard of it. And then suddenly, it's all you keep hearing. Oh. You know, Everyone's doing it. Everyone's yeah. starting to do it now. It's becoming yeah. very, very popular. Yeah. 
Uh, how, how was that experience? Yeah. So I think Iceland Fantastic. and the Camino were the two. If we had to pick two, that would be the main two. Um, Iceland, because it gave us, um, we, we hired a van, right? Um, uh, again, Iceland's very expensive, right? <laughs> I stopped drinking alcohol for two weeks while we were on wow, the road there be because we're seriously, it's pushing 20 Australian dollars for a beer. So, so we're prepared to make sacrifices um, when needed. And because we had the van, we, um, I don't know if you know Iceland, but there's one road around Iceland that takes in all the waterfalls, the glaciers, everything you need to see is on this one road around the country. Um, and we got a van and I felt like I was 18 again, you know, out on the road with my chick, you know, stopping wherever we wanted, getting down, seeing all these wonderful things and off we go again. And it was absolutely fantastic. Absolutely. I felt free. I felt alive. It was just wonderful. But no oh and there because... You don't have to pay to see any waterfall. You can go anywhere. You walk behind them. You walk on top of them. Um, but not only that, um, every almost every hour the scenery was different. I was always taking photos out the front of the van. It was just... Un but the thing is, though, we saved on sleeping in the van and eating in the van, all the campsites. Yeah. Um, and it, what we budgeted for, we were able to come a bit under. Fortunately, because we did it that way. Otherwise, it's horribly expensive. How long were you in Iceland? Sorry? Sorry. How long were you in Iceland for? Um, 10, we the, 12 days? Yeah. Like we 10 did, days to go all the way. At, at 10 days driving and then a night either side in Reykjavik. And again, the accommodation in Reykjavik is just so expensive. And, and I think we bought uh, sandwiches for dinner. It was just. It's that expensive, yeah. but but well worth going to. It's mm. just if you're prepared to do it on the cheap, and and that's the thing. We we really were prepared to do everything on the cheap. So um, and we were eating uh, a spaghetti and tomato sauce virtually every night because right? <laughs> really it's, 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 it's that oats for breakfast. Oats for breakfast. Yeah. So, but yeah. we we loved it. We it's absolutely good. loved it. Did you find that was long enough for a good look? I mean, no length of time's oh. long. Always plenty. Uh, Ten days is enough yes. to drive around. Yes. Yeah. You know, and and like it's a small country. It, yeah. It is a very small island. Um, so ten days was more than enough. We had a lot of snow on on the top part, which was unseasonal, which made driving with <laughs> particularly, <summer> tires. <laughs> particularly interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah. We coped. It was just yeah. like we have to slow it down. You know what yeah. I mean? Yeah. And around uh, Reykjavik, there's a lot of tours. It's very, very busy. But once you get that two days out of Reykjavik, there was no one on the roads. We had it all to ourselves. It was you know, just me in the campsites at night. Oh, and off-season, of course. It was, and we were slightly off-season. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another thing that I want to say to you. We tend to travel to certain places on the off-season, if you can. You know what I mean? We try and work it so that... Not completely off, but just in that shoulder. It's cheaper, easier. Because one of the problems we we find with travelling is the crowds sometimes. Yeah. The crowds in big cities just turns us off now. It's just, you know, like like Rome before this virus thing. But Rome, you know, it's just so busy, so many. Um, Edinburgh, we, we went to Edinburgh and we just couldn't move, you know. Mm. So we've tried to look for more adventurous things away from the beaten track, if you know what I mean. Yep. And that's where the Camino was absolutely fantastic. We did it at the start of the season, which was April, you know, so the crowds were down. Mm -hmm. um, and um, honestly, the six weeks we were walking, uh, we walked 944 kilometres in 44 days and it was just complete yeah. and utter freedom and it was an adventure and we'd walk five hours a day and then find a nice vino <laughs> because the alcohol there is cheaper than water. Um, so red wine every afternoon and do the blog and, you know, very good. I just, 
it was probably one of our greatest achievements. The feeling of walking into the Santiago at the end was yep. just amazing. And the people you meet, they're just some wonderful people. You walk for them for an hour, you may not see them again, but then you see them 20 days later, you know? Yeah. Um, so yeah, really, really good. That was probably one of the highlights. And that's something that we're actually planning on doing at the end of this year is just to, because when we did the Camino, uh, the walk from St. John Peak to Port, which is the start of the Francis, um, the, um, when you go over the top of the Pyrenees, was closed for snow. It was actually snowed in. So we had to go around by Val Carlos. So we missed that one part and it's bugging me. <laughs> I want to do it. So um, we've been invited to a 60th birthday party in Spain. So we're planning on just doing the first four days of the Camino again. Um, I'm walking over the Pyrenees and walk to Pamplona. What you what you're saying there about um, you know the the I guess the sense of pride of having done it and the achievement. Lita said exactly the same thing. The lady who we've interviewed, uh, who's done it, and she said exactly the same thing. It's one of her proudest achievements, I think, from having done it. And there's so many of these walks around as well. I mean, even the Camino itself. There's not just one route, is there? But in, in other parts, oh. the similar sorts of pilgrimage walks. And, and from what I can gather from people who do it, it's kind of almost a. a not surreal, but it's a, the sense of being able to reflect while you're walking is, I think, what a lot of people get out of it, isn't it? You feel as though, even if you're not religious, you feel like you're doing a pilgrimage and your and your your thought process is very similar, aren't they? What amazed me on the Camino was the amount of people that had quit their jobs, quit their life or whatever, they'd been working for 25 years or 20 years or whatever in one um, one career, and then suddenly just decided... I need to do something different. I need to change my life. And the walk in the Camino, to think about it, to think what could I do, where do I want to go, what do I want to achieve? And it gave them the time to think, you know, because they could walk with people, they could walk alone, they could do whatever they want. And that, I came across that so many times. So many different people said, this is what I was doing. And people were saying, oh, I'm, I'm an artist and I'm, I've got a block at the moment, I can't paint. So I've come to walk the Camino to think about it, to think what I can do and how I can improve. Mm. And it, it, people are there for all different reasons. In fact, I'm not a religious really, so to me it was an adventure, you know. Yeah. And it, it met all my needs as an adventure. Yeah. So. yeah. You don't have to be religious to get something out of it. I think that's, that's the, moral, yeah. the moral of the story. Um, Favourite website or travel app? What, what's your... What's your favourite app that you find on the road or your, your sort of, I guess, go-to resource that you love to use? Oh, we had quite a few when we first started out, um, but not so much now. Um, I th the, probably the one that I would use the most is called Tripper. And it, all, all the confirmations for accommodation, flights, trains, whatever, transport, everything, when the email comes in with confirmation, it puts it into the app and it puts things in order mm -hmm. and how to get there, how to, you know, it's a free, it's a free app, but I've used that right from the start. We did start off using an app um, which looked at our expenses, but he's so switched on with expenses, we didn't need that one. So <laughs> I got rid of that. Um, and then there's but, a booking. You know, Airbnb. And Airbnb is um, a lifesaver. I, I think it's losing a little bit of what it was four years ago because you got to meet the host all the time. You got to meet, yep. whereas towards the end, we started meeting boxes to put codes in. And, and that was fine by me because the organisation to try and meet up with an owner. Is a, is a yeah, but I like the meeting the owners yeah. and chatting when they to come them. And pick you up. They pick you up and you <laughs> yeah. know I like that contact with people. Yeah. But that seems to be diminishing now. And we noticed that. We used to get a bottle of wine in the fridge and a bit of food and that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. We experienced yeah. in the other days. Now it's become quite clinical. There's a lot of super hosts and so on. But as a as a resource it's becoming a business. It's still great. It just has lost mm. a bit of that personal touch. And I'm yeah. confident in some ways somebody might start up something that goes back to that original um, format mm. and tries to keep it like that because it was a wonderful experience in the early days and it is yeah yeah many hosts that will do that for you to the same extent 
Um, but it still beats hotels, I think. You know, you get flexibility with your check-ins and check-outs and, and price-wise, it's yeah. not so what's ahead for you guys? I know basically you, you're in probably a good time to talk about your, your current situation because you guys have been caught up in the bushfires. Um, your home yes. is below Sydney. Um, perhaps just tell us a little bit about your experience with that and what you've had to deal with. Oh, well, we came back December. We were away for three years and um, Diane was getting a bit fatigued by it. Um, I was keen to keep going, but Diane was finding she was getting tired by it all. So we decided to come back. Um, that coincided with a relative of Diane's passing away, which, you know, um, made it a bit difficult for her at the time. I had a few little medical things I had to sort out. Um, so last year, we basically um, we flew to... Um, uh, away three months, home three months, yeah. away four months, and back so, so, in December. So we thought we'd just cross off a few things that we really wanted to. We'd been invited to a 60th in Mexico, so we went there. I've always wanted to go to Cuba, so we went there. Um, and then I wanted to go to Sri Lanka. They had the bombings, so I went to Sri Lanka, and Diane went with her friend to Timor. Um, so we did that for three or four months, and then we came back and we had three months at home. And then we went away again, and the idea was to resume a uh, little, to get from London, uh, sorry, Barcelona to um, Florida by cruise. But we went to a few places. We went to Lebanon, and we went to Cyprus, and we went to Jordan. Okay. Now, one of my things is to get a photo with the seven wonders of the world. So um, I got to Petra, which I highly recommend, absolutely fantastic. So we've got five of the seven complete now, um, and we just have two more over in South America to, to work on. So that'll be down the track. Um, and then, um, so we've come back this time, and we arrived back the day we were the evacuated we were from evacuated. our house. Yeah. So we arrived back, and then they said, look, the fire's coming, you're gonna have to leave. Um, so, we evacuated, but the fire got within 900 metres of our house and then the wind changed and blew it the other direction, which was sad for other people, but it was good for us. Um, and then we had a month of problems yes. with the fires. Um, and now we've still got a few medical things to sort out, so we've decided to stay home till about September. Mm -hmm. Um, and then in September, we're going to go to Belgium, Luxembourg, and then up to Spain and just walk that little bit of the Camino, go to my friend's 60th, which is down near Malaga. And then we're probably going to do two months of just follow our nose, make things up as we go. We haven't planned exactly how we're going to do it. And then we'll come home. I'm 60 next year. So um, that's going to be the South American jaunts and um, re and hopefully resume that path we've weaved all the way to Florida without flight, continue around America and Canada. No. So that's basically it. But we're going to spend a little bit of time at home now, see the kids a bit more. I think they've forgotten what the parents look like. Um, and um, I, I, mean, I mean, that's one of the disadvantages that, of being away from home is that you miss out on weddings, you miss out on birthdays. Um, we were lucky enough that our kids came to see us three times overseas and stay with us without the, the partners and all that. They just came on their own. And so that was really lovely, um, you know, just to spend time with that. And we're very lucky they did that. Um, so, yeah. So basically limited travel this year, but, Hopefully next year we can kick back off. Nice. Guys, final question. How has this experience changed you as people? Hmm. I think I'm more, more, I'm not as judgmental as I used to be. I'm a bit more relaxed on things. I don't, I kind of go with the flow a bit more. Um, and I also think that, um, it's more important to to live your life than 
like now it's nice being at home, but I, I am craving that adventure, if, if, if you know what I mean. Um, yes, we can go for, do things around here, but that walking to the unknown, that really appeals to me. So, um, yeah, I, I think I've become a better problem solver. I think I've become a person that um, just lets things go a bit more. I don't become too fussed about them, if you know what I mean. Yep. Things go wrong, yeah, uh, we'll just move on. Somebody annoys me, yeah, okay, you annoy me, but I'm not going to make a deal, hassle with you. It's all part of, and I guess I've got a bit more empathy for people now. Um, we were both police, so we, we, we tended to expect people to listen to us, if you know what I mean, when we spoke, yeah. whereas now I tend to, okay, you know, but me. there is a trust factor from our jobs as well. You know, yeah. it's that that was another issue about Look, believing people. Like we never got caught up in scams because we always saw over the top of that. But but the thing was, I used to say to Diane, "Look, we need to trust people more." You know, some people are really nice and they're just trying to help us. Because <laughs> some people did help us for no reason at all. They just helped us, and then we go, "Okay, we'll let this person." Yeah. You, Oh, you've come, um, for example, I was in um, Sri Lanka and the guy was showing me around, like he came up to me and said, look, there's fish. And I'm going, oh, yeah. So I started talking and he said, let me show you around. I'm like, yeah, yeah. And then he showed me around for 10 minutes and then he went, uh, that'll be $20. Because you know, <laughs> yeah. I took you on a tour of the fish market. And I went, ah. Oh. You know, so you try and trust people, Yeah. you know, be a bit more open. And there's always those that let you down. but. Most, I keep going. Most people, I believe, are good, and I think most people are, but I can understand, given your background, why you might be a little bit cynical. You've seen the worst of society for a long period of time, and, and it's nice to hear, though, that you've built up a little bit more trust as a result of that. What about you, Di? How's it changed you as a person, do you think? Um, well, I don't know that it's changed me because we've always been travellers and lived in different countries. I feel that I'm... I'm, for me, I'm less tolerant of crowds. I find that I have moved right away from any tourist area, um, which is pretty sad. Like, I'm not, I'm not interested now in seeing, you know, TripAdvisor number one or two or three or four. I'm, I'm more about the outdoors adventures. Like, I liked Borneo. We're going to do a bike barge thing, so there's exercise involved change i don't know that i well okay i did have a few preconceived ideas on certain things and that has changed and i shouldn't and probably having less expectations i think <laughs> i don't think i've changed have i changed <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's a question you can't, you can't win on that answer, Dave. No. No, dear. It's nice to hear, though, that, I mean, you've done this and obviously, I mean, you, you kind of, three years in, you, you've, I can understand you wanting to go home for a bit and a lot of people do hit a little bit of a wall where they do that, but it's nice to hear that you guys are still passionate about going out and doing it again. You've obviously had no regrets about your experience. Um, which I think has been wonderful. I mean, as I say, last time we spoke, you guys were about to hit the road. You were excited, but there was a bit of trepidation there as well, I could sense with you. And um, it's, it's nice to hear you've had this adventure that you've had so much, obviously, that you've got out of it, probably more than you even realise you've, you've gained. And uh, it's been mm -hmm. worth while. So just tell us a bit about your blog and if people want to um, follow up with you, share your, uh, your details on that. Um, well, we call ourselves the Meandering Wanderers. So there's that element of meandering. We don't quite know where we're going. Um, and um, But we it was more a diary. It was more a travel diary um, rather than um, a blog per se. Um, all, all we did was describe where we went and what we did. And um, how we did it. And, and how we did it. And, and that was all. Um, we started off with a website. Um, and we did that for two years, but it became sometimes to do a uh, an actual um, 
post? A post, I was taking eight hours of my time just for one, you know. So we've now just gone to Facebook. We just have it on Facebook. We don't do the um, emails anymore. Um, and we just do basically where we're traveling. Um, it's, it's nice and light, you know, lots of photos um, and just where we've been. So it's a little bit quiet at the moment. Um, you know, that's about it. Um, we're not trying to make money out of it. We're not trying to make anything out of it. We're just doing it so that a lot of times we meet people and it's easier for them just to like our blog to keep in contact with rather than become friends and exchange. So they just like our blog. So, yeah, uh, on, on Facebook and then we meet up with them 18 months. There's one couple we met three times in the world. Wow. <laughs> we, and just through our, our, um, our Facebook account. And they started following us. We met them in Malaysia, and then we caught up in England, then we caught up in Italy. Um, it's just bizarre how things yeah. work out. Yeah. So, so basically, that's what our blog is for, our Facebook account. It's, it's just basically we're telling people back home, this is what we're doing, where we are. It's a diary. Some people like it. They follow us. So be it. You cool. know. So, yeah. And if we can help somebody, we help them. Cool. So, so it's meanders, meandering wanderers. We'll put a link up for your uh, blog if they want to check out what you've done in the past, or the Facebook page, meandering wanderers, for your more recent uh, experiences of what's been happening. So, guys, look, thank you. It's been a pleasure speaking with you both, and uh, we look forward to keeping up with your travels going forward from here. Okay, thank you very Thanks, much. Tony.